There's yttrium, ytterbium, actinium, rubidium, a boron, gadolinium, niobium, iridium, and strontium, and silicon, and silver, and samarium, and bismuth, chromium, lithium, beryllium, and barium. Right, so we're on to the next part. In the last part, we talked about anions. In this part, we're going to talk about the cations. And remember that the ions are a charged particle, either negatively charged in the form of anions or positively charged in the form of cations. And you should also know that anions and cations will come together. So you're going to have a anion, which is already nonmetals, coming together with a cation, which are the metals, to form, for example, Na is a cation and Cl is an anion. They'll come together to form sodium chloride, which is a salt. Those salts can either be soluble or insoluble. And that property we can use to test for different types of ions in solution. Right? And the dot point, what we had to do is we had to deduce the ions present in a sample from the results of a, t of a test. Right? So we have this sample here. We don't know what's inside. And what we can do is we can do different types of tests to figure out what kind of ions are in solution. And we often use this principle that you can form insoluble or soluble form, um, salts to test out what's actually in that solution. Now, last time we talked about the anions. This time we're going to talk about the cations. Remember, cations were the metals. So there were ions from metals, which are these ones here. Or these ones here. And the ones where you have to specifically know are these five. Lead, barium, calcium, copper, and iron. And you can see lead is Pb2+. Plus, so barium is Ba2+, plus, all of these pluses being the cations. Calcium is Ca2+, plus, copper is Cu2+, plus, and iron. There's two versions of iron, either Fe2+, plus or Fe3+, plus, two different types of iron. Right, so we have to find out how we can f differentiate between these in, this, in the actual sample. So we'll jump straight to it. So in this case, we have the same kind of tree that we did in the last video. And if you have not watched the last video yet, make sure to watch the last video before you watch this video, so you can follow this link. The last video is quite useful to exp like understanding this video. When it comes to what we saw about first, we have this unknown solution, right? So this unknown solution here, which is this one here. We don't know what's inside that actual solution. We want to figure that out. In this case, we're going to do five different types of tests because there's five cations which we're trying to figure out. First test, we'll try to figure out if, we have, if there's lead in the solution. Second test, we'll first, second test, we'll figure out if there's calcium and or barium in the solution. The third test can differentiate between calcium and barium, right? So these two tests are related. The fourth test will test for iron, more specifically both the either the iron three plus or the iron two plus, and the fifth test will test for copper. Right? Make sure again the whole idea is keeping in sequence, so make sure that you always do them in that actual sequence. And we're going to start with the first test. So this time we're going to make it a lot more simpler. There's no equations for this tree. It's just we're doing the, diff, putting different things in and seeing what happens. So the first thing is we're going to have a solution, unknown solution, and we're going to add some HCl. Right? First, we're going to test for lead. We're going to add some hydrochloric acid. There's our solution here. We're going to add some hydrochloric acid, and we're going to see what happens. If we add the hydrochloric acid and a white precipitate forms, that means lead is present. If no white precipitate forms, that means lead is not present. Right? So if you see this white precipitate forming, you know that lead is present. And the reason why is because in this case, if you add, we are adding hydrochloric acid, and hydrochloric acid will form a precipitate with the lead particle. It will be called um, lead chloride, and that's the precipitate. So the first test, we've confirmed if lead is there, we know that it's for the white precipitate. If no lead is there, then no precipitate forms. What we're going to do for the second test is we're going to filter it out again. We don't want to have these precipitates inside, so if they happen, if they are actually there, we're going to make it, uh, remo make it removed for filter, right? So filtrate means that we have removed the actual white bits for filter paper. We have only the solution left. So what we're going to do next is we're going to do the second step. We're going to add some calcium. Sorry, we're going to test for calcium or barium. That's what we're going to test for. And we're going to do that by adding sulfuric acid, H2SO4. We're going to add that acid into here, and we're going to see what happens. If a white precipitate forms, that means that calcium and or barium are present. Right, so we're testing for two things here. So if you have a precipitate forming, that means there's definitely some either calcium 
or barium or both in that solution. Right? That we you know that we know that for definite. Now, if that's the case, if we know that there's a white precipitate has formed, what we're going to do is we're going to do the whole experiment again because we know now that either calcium or barium are present, but we don't know which one exactly. So we're going to do the return to this step, return to the filtrate, and go to step three. Right? We only go to step three if step two is positive. Right? So if this is positive, if this has shown you a precipitate forming, we're going to go to step three. And we're going to do that with our original solution. And what we're going to do is we're going to add some sodium fluoride. This is sodium fluoride here, sodium fluoride. We're going to add that into that solution. Now, in this case, if a white precipitate forms, that means calcium is present. So if a white precipitate forms, calcium present. Whereas if no precipitate forms, that means barium is present. So that's how we can differentiate between the two. If a white precipitate forms, we know that calcium is present. If no precipitate forms, we know that barium is present. Right, so we do step three only if step two actually formed a precipitate. And that's now so far we've tested for lead, we've tested for calcium, and we've tested for barium. And then we return up and we return to the fourth step. And we're trying to keep it in sequence. Now we're going to use our original unknown solution. And we're going to do the iron test. We're going to add some sodium hydroxide, which is a base. Now we're adding a base in that solution. Right, so that same solution here, we're adding NaOH into it. We're going to see what happens. If a brown precipitate forms, what that means is, so if there's a brown precipitate forming, that means there is iron inside. Not, not just iron, but iron 3+. plus. If a green or a white green precip precipitate forms, so green or white green, and they can both form, right? It could be both of them inside. But if they form, then we know that iron 2 plus ions, cations are present. And if a blue precipitate, I wrote, but I keep writing participate, precipitate, that's what I was meant to write. But um, if a blue precipitate forms, so if a blue one forms, I, I just make it pink and purple just because you can see it. But if a blue one forms, that means that it's possible that copper is present, right? So if a blue one forms, we're going to go to step five. If a blue one doesn't form, we're not going to go to step five. But if a and blue one basically will always form, but if when it when it does form, we're going to do step five, which is the copper test. So here we're going to add some NH three, which is ammonia. Right, so now we're just Focusing for this test, if, for example, a brown precipitate and a green white precipitate formed, we don't really worry too much about that. All we're going to do is we're going to have the blue precipitate. We're going to look at the blue precipitate and we're going to add our ammonia, right? So we're going to add ammonia inside and we're going to see what happens. And if the precipitate dissolves to form a dark blue solution, so if the actual precipitate here is gone, it just dissolves again and the whole solution is dark blue, that means copper is present. Okay. So I'll quickly go over those five again. If for, These are all our primary tests. I'm going to still go over the secondary tests, but these are our primary tests. For the first step, we're testing for lead, we're adding hydrochloric acid into solution. For white precipitate forms, that means lead is present. If no precipitate forms, no lead is present. For the second step, we're going to filter the whole thing, we're going to remove the precipitate, then we're going to add some sulfuric acid into solution. If a white precipitate forms, that means that either or calcium or barium is in the solution. So what happens then is we're going to use that original solution and do the third step if the second step is positive, if the second step forms a precipitate. For the third step, we can add some sodium fluoride into that solution. If a white precipitate forms, we know that calcium is actually present. If no precipitate forms, we know that barium is present. Right, so that's how we can differentiate between the two. The first step is quite general, and then the second second step here managed to differentiate between two. So for the fourth step, what we did is we tested for iron. We did that by adding sodium hydroxide into that solution. If a brown precipitate forms, that means there is Fa3+, um, Fa3 plus in it. If a green or white green precipitate forms, when adding sodium hydroxide, that means Fa2 plus is in it. And if a blue precipitate forms, that means we can do some further testing. And if the blue precipitate, precipitate, the blue precipitate forms, we're going to add 
sodium, uh, sorry, ammonia into a solution and see what happens. And if that blue precipitate forms and it now dissolves, so if that, that one that formed dissolves that may, into a dark blue solution, that means copper is present, right? So now that's how we can test for these anions. These were all our primary tests. Now we're going to show you some secondary tests as well, and some of them being quite important. It's more specifically, this one, the flame test. Now you're going to have to do, I think, a flame test probably, I mean, I mean it's actually not, you don't have to, you probably want to be doing this test, because it's quite fun, this test. But this is a confirmation test for cations. So confirmation test, remember, this was the second test you do after your primary test. And the flame tests are generally always your confirmation tests. Now what is a flame test? Well, in the flame test, you're basically putting, so inside here, will be a solution of, for example, some of your cations, so your calcium, your barium, your copper cations, and you're going to spray them over a fire. And the reason why something happens, why the, the thing is you're going to have different types of, of flames. You're going to have either a green flame, for example, for copper, or you're going to have a red flame for calcium. So you can detect what's inside by the flames that come out of it. The reason why this happens is, with the flame test, you can imagine this, for example, let's say this is one of, this is maybe sodium, right? This is the structure of sodium. It's not the actual structure, but this is, this is the atomic structure of sodium, right? You have these atomic rings. Remember the first atomic ring, this is your nucleus here. The first atomic ring has two electrons, the second has eight, and the last one has one in its outer shell. Now, if we put a flame under it, right, what will actually happen to that last one is it will become excited because there's more energy, which is inside that actual electron. So it will jump to a outer shell, right? It's jumped from this shell to this shell here because it became excited, it just had more energy. But what's going to happen eventually, after the flame is gone, or during the, during the time it's, it's in the actual fire, is, so this is where it is now, so this is whilst it's still being flamed, but then it's going to jump down. It's going to move, not to the original one, it's going to move to one in between, right? It was here originally, then it jumped up, and now it's going back down again. And when it goes back down, because that's all about energy, what kind of energies are there? Heat energy, flame energy, not flame energy, <laughs> heat energy, light energy, etc., etc. What happens is energy that is lost here is converted into light energy. You don't need to know all this, but just this might be interesting. But this light energy is the thing that actually makes the flame a different color. I see each different types, type of element will make a different color. Or most, most elements, most metallic elements will make different colors when they have its flame test done to them, right? And you should know that we can use the second test, so the confirmation test for calcium, because if we put it on the flame, uh, as I just described earlier, then it will make a red flame. Barium will make a yellow-green flame, and copper will make a green flame. Now, how does, does the test work again? Again, we can do one or two things. Either you're going to put it in a spray bottle, so you're going to put your solution of your cations into that spray bottle, and you're going to spray it against a flame, and you're going to see which color does this flame turn into. Does it turn into green, or does it turn into red? Or what you're going to do is you're going to have, this is like a test tube here. And in this test tube, you're going to put your, some acid, you're going to put some acid. And you're also going to put your cation as well. So you're going to have a solution of acid and cation. Then you're going to mix it with either, you're going to grab a wire or something else that you can mix it with. Right, so here you put some stick into it. And basically, the actual solution is on a stick, and the stick itself will then go into a flame. And you're going to observe what color the flame changes to. Right? There's a couple of ways of doing it, but the main idea is just that you're basically checking for changing in color. If it's a certain color, it means a certain type of cation is present. And we can really only test these three, calcium, barium, and copper. So it's a confirmation test for these three are flame tests. The confirmation test, there are confirmation tests for iron and that as well, but because I've already covered so much material, and you don't really need to know that for your exam, I'm not going to cover them now, but you just should know that there's also confirmation tests for both iron and lead. But overall, you should know about, so what I want you to know, what I want you to take out of this video, and the last video, is I want you to know the sequence, the right sequence of testing for both for the anions and the cations. Right? So there's sequence of anions and cations. You should know the reagent, so the reagent that you would use so for different types of tests. So for example, you know, we said quite some time back that for the carbonate, right, for the carbonate, if you want to test for carbonate, your reagent would be, in this case, you'd be using 
nitric acid, right? That was the acid that you put inside and you observe bubbles. So the reagent is always the ingredient they use to test your actual, for your, for your actual cation or anion. So you should know that as well. So you should not just be able to know the actual sequence, but you should also be able to explain the sequence. So understand why we're doing that sequence. But that's more or less the most important part. Like these, so overall, and I'm going to go, so in the future, you'll see at the end of this video, there'll be lots of links to different types of practice questions, which come from EHC exam questions, because you should definitely practice that. It's not really that hard, but overall, it's just lots of information. And you should also know about the flame test as well. But more specifically, what you can actually, so you can measure calcium, barium, and copper with the flame test. You don't need to know the details of the theory behind the flame test. But yeah, hopefully this wasn't too, not too much, but um, rest assured, you know, the HC exam questions will come up and then you'll see what you need to know when it comes to this stop point. I hope that, hopefully that was useful. Thank you for watching.